We are in class number 11 in our series on putting on the whole armor of God. Um, again, thank you for joining us and I ask that if you get the opportunity that you just let us know that you're there or that maybe uh, if you have a comment that you'd like to make concerning the series that we're doing or uh, just about Bible optics and its, uh, its ministry to you and its, its impact on your life. Uh, or if you have a question concerning something that we're doing, uh, please feel free to uh, go ahead and, and uh, connect with us there on on the uh, on Facebook, if you would. And uh, if, if you would consider maybe sharing what we're doing with others, uh, it certainly would help us to get the word out there and give us that opportunity to impart and impact the lives of others as well. Uh, we've been in this series and I have a lot to cover this morning, so let me see if we can jump into it and uh, and, and get this covered. Uh, we started to talk about putting on the whole armor of God. So I want to read uh, this to you. In Ephesians chapter 6 is the body of text that we eventually arrived at. This is what we want to talk about and revolve around. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, Paul is speaking here in the book of Ephesians to the church in Ephesus, and he's summarizing a... Uh, the thoughts that he has revealed on all the privileges that have been given to us in Christ Jesus, our position in Christ and uh, the purpose and plan of God for us in Christ and getting our act together so that we could then and now through what has been afforded us live uh, an influential life and we were talking about having that influence on the spiritual realm which affects the affairs of men so that, that's what we've been talking about so he says finally my brethren be strong in the lord and again that strength that's a a, a verb that tells us to um present imperative it means once you start the action continue to continue to develop evolve and grow in finally my brethren be strong in the lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of god not half of it portion of it a lot of it put the whole lot uh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to be established or to withstand uh, against the systematic methodical attacks. And again, the devil has the ABCs. He starts at A, works to B. If he gets to B, he'll go to C. He can't go from A to C. He's got to work his way through. And the thing about it is his in, his determination is to go to Z and and totally kill, steal, or destroy all these aspects of your life. First uh, John 1 and 9 allows us to stop him at any any stage in the process to confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we go back to A. And think about it as we grow in the Lord and in the power of his might. We learn what's going on. We understand the strategies against us and we get wise to it and we start to mature in it. And he doesn't get as far down the street as he did the last time and it doesn't happen as frequently as it did before and we grow strong in the Lord and we find ourselves being able to be established against these systematic methodical at attacks of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places and we've been discussing and we will discuss on a later subject uh, just about the order of the kingdom of darkness there is two kingdoms the kingdom of god and the kingdom of darkness and it is ordered it's ordered by fear but nonetheless it has order and structure to it but we'll take that up in another but we're not fighting flesh and blood the influence upon flesh and blood comes from this other arena and this is the arena that we are engaging and here's how we do it wherefore take on to you or because we're not engaging flesh and blood but these entities take on to you the whole armor of god that you may be able to again withstand or be established in the evil day or when the dust settles you'll still be the one standing and having done all to stand or having deliver the blow keep your guard up in other words it's not a once only victory but it's a continuous engagement uh, so we we may win on one front but that doesn't mean we drop uh, our guard we keep our guard up and we're ready to go again go again go again so we're we're in a conflict we're in a wrestling engagement stand therefore having your loins geared about with truth this is these are seven parts of this armor having your loins geared about with truth having on the breastplate of righteousness your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace 
and above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one is what that is take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit these both are the word of god praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit watching thereon to it all perseverance and supplication for all saints so these are the seven parts of the armor of god and this is the part we want to get into a um, in a minute it says uh, we, we went we made this comparison as well paul speaking to the church in rome says the night is far spent and the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and then he encourages us paul describes it this way put on the armor of light so we say, well, that's obviously the armor of God. You're right, it is the armor of God. Then he continues in his thought and says, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in clambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. And then he refers to the same armor of light again or the same armor of God again. But here's the terminology he uses now. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says, put ye on the armor of light. Now he refers to the same putting on of the armor of light in this manner in verse 14. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh but to, ful uh, uh, or to fulfill the lust thereof. So putting on the armor of God is putting on the armor of light is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about how they were literally not putting on garb per se like as, as a Roman soldier although many references are made to that as far as armor protectiveness is but truly what we're putting on is the Lord Jesus Christ or we're stepping into the nature the character the quality the substance the authority rank and power of the Lord Jesus we are stepping into him and it's like that a uh, police officer I, I showed in, in an earlier lesson who you know had authority but when you put that police officer in the in in the chieftain tank or in the in the the challenger tank you now not just give him authority but you give him the power to enforce that authority and that's what we are we have authority but in Christ in the armor of God we have the power not just to enforce that for our life because we have authority for our life but the authority to influence the affairs of man we do that when we jump into christ so to speak and we we engage the enemy not just with the authority but the power to enforce it and so jesus is every part of the armor of god he is truth he is righteousness he is our peace he is the author of faith he is the salvation he is our the word of god and he is our intercessor so these are the comparisons that we made now last week we talked about truth and truth is to unveil reality and we jesus described to us how that no man had seen god at any time except the son and jesus came to unveil to reveal even though man hadn't seen the father even though man hadn't a a, a, a physical five senses awareness of god in the sense of seeing him or touching him or whatever jesus was manifest and he became the unveiling of that truth and so when you touched and hugged and talked with and saw the lord jesus christ you were touching god you were touching the father you were listening to the father you were receiving the standards from the father you were watching the actions of the father that's what jesus came to do and so we we when it talks about us putting on truth people weren't there for the resurrection of jesus people weren't there for his ascension into heaven but he lives he has triumphed over sin and death and the proof of it is me and the proof of it is you that are born again of the spirit of god and so part of the armor of god is us making the determination as jesus was truth or the unveiling of the reality of the heavenly father and his existence and his purpose and his plan and his attitude and his standards we now put on truth we make that quality decision that we are going to use our life to unveil the reality that although you haven't been there and didn't see him he is really 
risen. He really is seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. And how do I know? Because when you see me, you see him. When you hear me, you hear him. When you watch me, you watch him. I become the unveiling of that reality that Jesus Christ is not dead, but that he is alive because he lives in and through me. And this is the very first part of the armor. This is the decision we have to make. And this decision has to be made in, for, in order to put on the next part of the armor correctly. And, and trying to put on the next part of this armor correctly without making this decision in your life that your life is going to personify, your life is going to um, demonstrate the intent and the purpose and the plan and the will and the standard and the moral and the value of God, that Jesus Christ is alive, that he has triumphed over sin and death, that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. If, if you don't make that decision, then it's very hard to wear the next part of the armor with effect. So we summarize it in this manner. Dress yourself with the decision that your life now lived will reveal the fact that Jesus Christ is risen, is alive and lives through me. Paul said, it's no longer I that live it, but the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, he's living through me now. I'm the living proof that Jesus actually is risen. And this is a determination, this is a, an intent that we have to have in order to put on the armor of God and to step into this reality because this is part of the, the um, armor that we will wear when we engage in that arena of the spirit um, where we deal with principalities and powers. We step in and say, here I am, my life by purpose and intent is to reveal God's or Jesus' victory, his intent, his purpose, his morals, his values, his plan, and here I am. That's, my, that's the intent of my life now. So I, I'm down here. When you see and hear and watch me, you are witnessing him. This is what it means to put on. And again, it's, it's a, you have to, it doesn't happen accidentally. You have to live with this intent. Get up every day and realize People are going to realize when they watch, see, and hear, they are watching, seeing, and hearing Christ alive in and through me. Now, I want to take up this next part because we, we put this on in sequence. We dress in sequence. And unfortunately, what happens happened to so many believers is they, they pick portions of this. They talk about faith or they talk about salvation. And, and they grab portions of it, but they're not appropriately dressed. And therefore, it's not, it doesn't effectually work. There's an there's the order to what God is doing. So this is the first part of that order. A decision that my life is going to personify the risen Christ. Once I have that decided, then I put this on. Wherefore, take on to you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Haven't done all to stand. Stand there for having your loins geared about with truth, this decision, I'm going to personify Christ, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. And that's what I want to discuss with you this morning. Righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, I, I need to, to define uh, righteousness and, and help us to get a grasp of what exactly that is and what exactly we are putting on. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, Paul, um, speaking to the church at Corinth, by the Spirit of God, says, It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us. Here's what Christ has become for us. Has become for us wisdom from God. This is how God thought it or planned it. That is, speaking of Jesus, he is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Righteousness is something that has been done. It's it's now it's an it's it's achieved. It's past. Holiness is something that we're going to now currently doing and redemption is something that we will experience when the full when the fullness of what has been paid for is is collected. When our bodies get the fullness of the what, what the down payment was paid for we we actually pick it up we pick up our new glorified bodies but righteousness holiness jesus has made on to us righteousness holiness and redemption past present 
future. When I say past, it's be I, I say that because a lot of times people run around in the new birth now trying to be righteous. They, they, they're, they, there's a, a, a sin consciousness within the body of Christ. And we, we shouldn't be sin conscious. Sin conscious always reminds us of what we were and what we did and how weak we are and how ungodly uh, we used to be. How ineffectual, how inefficient we were without Christ. That's sin consciousness, when we were aware of what we were as sinners. But we need to be righteous, we need righteous conscious. We need to be aware of who we are and what has been done for us through the new birth experience. I mean, if Jesus came and did what Jesus did and left us the same as what we were, what was the point of doing it? I mean, what was the whole purpose of Jesus coming to do what Jesus done if he left us the same as we were before his death, burial, and resurrection? What was it he came to achieve by his death, burial, and resurrection? Obviously, if I'm a new creature in Christ and I'm born again of the Spirit of God, surely I'm not the same individual that I was before Jesus became the Lord of my life. Surely something has happened to me. If I was a sinner before I became a Christian, why would I continue to be a sinner after I become a Christian? Or is what Jesus did done by his death, burial, and resurrection not sufficient or not powerful enough to change me? Well, the truth of the matter is it was, and it is. And it's called righteousness. But unfortunately, there are so many because of, of, of a bad optic and bad teaching think that they are still the sinner that they wear and fail to understand that what you wear, you wear in Adam. What you are as a newborn believer, you are now in Christ. What you wear in Adam was a sinner. What you are in Christ is the righteousness of Almighty God. And this is something you need to put on. It's something we need to, to, to don our our psyche with because if we're going to step into uh, this this parallel world if we're going to engage these principalities whatever we got to go in there with the full knowledge and awareness that who and what is stepping in there is not me from my past but this new creature who i am in christ righteous and if you doubt that then you will be convinced when you go out to engage the, these entities or, 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 or this domain of the spirit, you'll, you'll be knocked senseless with a, in a sense of guilt and inferiority and unworthiness and unholiness and, and you won't last two minutes out there. You've got to make this decision, I'm going to glorify, magnify and reflect Jesus in my life. Then you've got to take on this knowledge and this awareness and understanding, I am righteous. Not because of what I've done or who I was in Adam, but now because of who I am in Christ. And when I step into that arena and, and the opposition says, but you're no good, I remember what you did last summer, we know blah, 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 and starts to bring out the skeletons in the closet and all of the stuff of the past, you can stand there and say, you ain't talking to that individual anymore. I am not sin, a sinner in Adam, I am righteous in Christ. And that attitude and that awareness and that understanding is critical for you to in, in, enable you, empower you to stand in that arena and engage at that level. So it says here, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom of God. That is, he's become our righteousness, our holiness and our redemption. And this righteousness is something we've got to get a handle on in order to put on the whole armor of God. Now, the definition of righteousness. The definition of righteousness is the ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. It's this ability to be able to walk into the presence of an almighty, holy, righteous, glorying God and not feel a sense of inferiority or guilt. Being able to walk right in, have such a relationship, have such 
a right relationship with God that I can walk right into his presence and when I do and as I do, I don't feel inferior and I don't feel guilt. Boy, that's, that's acceptance to the full. That, that, is a, that's, that is relational purity. That is, that is this understanding that what Jesus did for me, what Jesus has done for us, gives us an ability to walk right into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. It's an incredible privilege and it's an incredible achievement that was, that was, that was given to man through Jesus Christ. The ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. So when you step into this arena to engage principalities and powers and they start to remind you or tell you that you're a sinner or you're unholy or you're ungodly or you're not worthy or so on and so forth, you, you, you need to have this understanding. Here, pal, I have the ability to come into the presence of Almighty God himself without a sense of inferiority or guilt. I'm righteous, conscious. And this is what righteousness is, the ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. Now, under sin, because man, th this ability to come into the presence of God without the sense of inferiority or guilt is something that has now been given to us in Christ. It was something that Adam had originally. And Adam lost this privilege. Sin didn't distort God, it distorted Adam. Adam had this sense of inferiority or guilt, and this sense of inferiority or guilt or unrighteousness disqualified Adam being able to come into the presence of God. It, it didn't change God, it changed man. It changed man's ability. He became sin conscious. And, and, and so when we look in the world today, there are people who try to or want to or endeavor to come into the presence of God because they, they all want that relationship. But without Christ, they try to do it man's way. So in the world today, we have man's version of righteousness and God's version of righteousness. Or should I say we have man's standard of righteousness and God's standard of righteousness. Or should I say man has an opinion as to what it is he needs to do to qualify him to be able to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. Or God has a standard or a way in which God says, this is the way you come into my presence without a sense of inferiority or guilt. Man's righteousness and God's righteousness. Man's righteousness is this. Man's righteousness is the claim of that higher authority which a person adopts as his own standard and based on his own efforts to achieve that standard. Let me slow this down for a minute. Man's righteousness is when man, human beings, they want to they wanna reach out to, they want to come into, have relationship with God. And so it's the claim of that higher authority, because different people have different versions of God, but this is, say, I want to come into the presence of Ag, my God. So it, it is the claim of a higher authority which that person adopts as his own standard. Well, you know, if I do this and I do that, then I'm okay. And based on my own efforts now to achieve that standard. So I pick the God that I want, and then I pick the standard that I think that I can achieve to give me access to the God I picked. I'm righteous. And, and, and that, where, is, where does that make sense? So I pick, this is, this is God for me. I worship this or I worship that. And in order for me to have that favor of the God that I pick to be my standard, I now set up the rules that, that I think govern what it empowers me to have a right relationship with the God that I picked and, uh, and these rules I can achieve. So I pick the God, I pick the rules, and therefore, I pick my standard of righteousness. So you hear people say, well, I believe if I don't do anything bad, and if I don't do, and I treat all people fairly, and I, if I treat people equally, 
I'll get to heaven. Well, who said that? Well, that's my opinion. I, I envisage that God is like this and, and God would look at me. This is the authority that I've picked and this is the God that I'm thinking of. Um, and I would imagine that if I live a pretty good life and I'm pretty good to most people, that yeah, that, I think that's good enough. I think he'd take me. So therefore, that's the standard. That's the God that I've picked. That's the 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 effort that I can achieve or give to, to achieve righteousness. And, and so that's what I think. Then other people think, well, you know what? I'm not even sure that there is a God there, but you know what? I think he just loves everybody. So it doesn't really matter what I do. Uh, I think he'll just accept me because God is love. And so I set that. That's the authority that I picked. That's the standard that I think I can achieve. And so I draw that standard up and I claim that if I do that, I'm righteous. And I understand you're doing that, but that doesn't mean that it works. And religion, and many religions, all pick God or some level of God or some version of God, and then they set some set of standards that they think that they can achieve in order to make them be able to come into the presence of God, their God, that God, without a sense of inferiority or guilt. But that doesn't necessarily mean that because they picked that certain standard or what they thought and they think they can achieve it, that that's almighty God's standard. This is man's version of righteousness. The claim of that higher authority, which a person adopts as his own standard and based on his own efforts to achieve that standard. Religions do that all the time. Some religions say, you know, if you, if you confess your sins and, and take these emblems, um, uh, that you'll get absolution and that, 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 that's what makes you righteous. Others believe if you punish yourself or isolate yourself behind some wall somewhere and don't speak for the rest of your life, that that'll make you um, uh, or give you the ability to come into the presence of God uh, without a sense of inferiority. That will make you righteous. Well, that's men picking their standard of what they think God is and, and then setting their own goals and feeling that if they achieve the goals that they set, that they'll get it. That's man's righteousness. But it's not necessarily God's righteousness. So let's look at the difference. Man's righteousness is deemed in Scripture like this. But Isaiah said, But we all are as an unclean thing. The unclean thing here he's talking about is the, the item that, that women would discard after their cycle, eh, their monthly cycle. So he says, We are as an unclean rag or an unclean thing. And then he describes what is an unclean thing or discarded as an unclean thing. We are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as these filthy, discarded, throw away their soiled rags. All our righteousness. The righteousness he's talking about here is man's trying to set his own standard based upon his own efforts to achieve that standard to give him the right to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. This is man's righteousness. But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. That's what it means. All our efforts are discarded. They don't work. They'll never achieve and undo what Adam done when Adam sinned and, and made humanity unrighteous. Or, or took the privilege away from us. In Romans 10, 3, God, Paul speaking of the religion of the Jews and this religious idea that if I'm more religious and I wear longer prayer shawls and I pray longer and, and, and I give more money and I, that this will, this will purchase for me, obtain for me that ability to come into the presence of God because I'm holy, because I pray longer, louder, give more, look holier. And Paul says, nah, that doesn't do it either. That's religion. So Paul says, speaking of, of, of the Pharisees and Sadducees and the people of his day, of which he was one. So he's speaking from experience. It says, for they have been ignorant of God's righteousness. Now he said they were ignorant of God's righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness. So God has a standard. 
But they, they, they were ignorant of God's standard and they tried to set their own standard, thinking that if I do this or I do that, I can come into the presence of God. That affords me. I, f I fasted for 40 days, so when I pray, God will answer my prayers. You didn't fast at all, so God's not going to answer your prayers. So God will answer me because I fast. No, he won't. Your, your standards and, and your effort to achieve those standards and because you achieve your standards doesn't mean God has to accept you at all. For they have been ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves onto the righteousness of God. You either submit yourself to one or the other. You're either trying to achieve this, this access to God this relationship with God, this pure relationship with God, you're trying to either access it by your own standard or you do it by God's standard. He goes on here to say, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes it. And that's what we're going to talk about. So there's, there's two, two approaches to this relationship with God that Adam forfeited when he sinned, that Adam lost for us when he sinned and, and put us in this position where we we didn't have that ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt because we were sin conscious. We, we had all sinned and we were all aware of, of how inadequate we were in the presence of a holy, righteous, loving, caring, awesome God. We couldn't do it. We just, we, we, we sinned. And, and so we now set up a whole standard and think, well, if I do this, God obviously is going to take me. No. They were ignorant of God's righteousness, went about trying to establish their own righteousness and didn't submit themselves to God's righteousness. So, ignorant means they, that it's, it can be known, but they didn't, they didn't know it. So, we're going we're gonna to look at that. It says, is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law that could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. There's a lot of people think if I kept a bunch of rules, that those rules would make me righteous. He says, well, if that was the case, then, then righteousness would have come through the law. But we're going to find out that the law, even the law that God gave to the children of Israel, it couldn't make people righteous in the sense of, of make a, 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 a totally cleanse them and change them. It, it couldn't do it. And God had to do it another way. And that's what we're going to look at. Concerning zeal, Paul spoke about his own life. Concerning zeal in his past life as a, as a zealot, as a, as a religious zealot, Paul says concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which of, of, the, of, the, of the law, Paul said, I was blameless. Paul said, I, I really went after this other version. I really got into it. I mean, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee of Pharisees. He precedes this with. And he says, I'll tell you, I had a zeal. I mean, I was so zealous that when, when the church that you and I are a part of, when it first was birthed by the, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, he said, I, I persecuted the very thing that God was doing. That's how zealous I was for man's righteousness. Because I thought by doing that, I was going to make myself okay with God. And I didn't realize what was going on. Concern and zeal, I persecuted the church. Church, touching the righteousness of God, uh, which is in the law. Paul said, I was blameless. But we're going to find out. Paul realized it still didn't make me righteous. But I tried that. I mean, I was excellent at that. But it didn't, it didn't change me. And it doesn't. It's not the solution. Man's righteousness, man's standard, man's efforts to make themselves accepted in God are not sufficient. But here's God's righteousness. Here's God's standard. Righteousness is the state of being commanded by God that stands the test of his judgment. Wow. God's righteousness. Now remember, man's righteousness is, is a standard set by man that's achievable by man, thinking that if I achieve the standard that I set, that allows me to come into the presence of God. But it doesn't. That's not the standard. The true standard of having a right relationship with God is God. God is the standard. Righteousness is the state of being commanded by God. God sets it. Commanded by God, not us. Well, if I do this and I do that, you'll accept me. No, God said, that's not the way it works. I set the standard for the relationship, not you. 
Righteousness is the state of being commanded by God that stands the test of his judgment. Not my opinion. Well, I just want to, if I do this and I do that, you got to accept me. God says, no, you're not the standard. I'm the standard of this relationship. I set the, the rules. I set the parameters. And r this relationship is, is a state of being commanded by God that stands the test of his judgment. And then I put down here, that standard is based on himself. He is that standard. So, oh, boy, that is way beyond my reach. Yes, way beyond all of our reaches. God's the standard for righteousness. God's the standard for holiness. He set that standard. He doesn't come down to the lowest common denominator. That's not the way it works with God. God won't lower his standard for me and lower his standard for you. He's not going to take upon us our standard to communicate with us. But he will, because he, is, he will lift us to his standard. This is what his righteousness is. It's not us trying to achieve that standard, our standard, by our efforts. It's God who is the standard saying, you know what, guys, I got to go bring you to mine. And that's why it's God's righteousness that prevails. It's, we have to have God's righteousness, not man's. I hope you're with me. In Genesis 3, 8, it says, for this is Adam and Eve, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. In the first part of this verse, they had heard the voice of the Lord God walking and talking with him in the cool of the day, or walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And, and here we see that God, Almighty God, used to come down into the Garden of Eden, this, this environment, and he would talk and walk with Adam and Eve. They had this relational connect that they could come right into the presence of God and have a relationship with the Almighty God, even though they were a created being because God treated them as righteous right standing they had a right relationship but that all changed man when when God used to come down and walk and talk with Adam in in the cool of the day Adam and Eve obviously it was, it was because they had a righteousness they they had the ability to come into the presence of God they, they were allowed to do it and because they were pure and because they were holy and because sin had not entered into and through Adam yet into the world, they were righteous. They, they had the ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. That was the privilege they had because of the relationship. They were righteous. But when Adam sinned, Adam lost that privilege. It marred the relationship, not between God and man. God never changes. He's the Lord God and he changes not. But it changed man's approach to God. Man became sin conscious. Man became aware of his unholiness and his ungodliness. And man felt a sense of inferiority and guilt. And that changed the relationship. It changed the way man approach God. Now, people have this idea, you know, God can't stand sin and, and, and you know, when we come in, God says, no, I can't. I, that's, that's not the way it is. God didn't change his attitude towards man because man sinned. God still loved man. He loved man in this condition and he loved man when he became unrighteous. God never stopped loving man. Sin didn't change God. God didn't abhor mankind because man sinned. God didn't stop talking to man because man sinned. Sin didn't change God. Sin changed man's attitude towards God. Man became aware of sin and inferiority and guilt. God didn't stop talking to man. In Genesis chapter 4, God is, although he had put them out of the garden, although they lost the privilege of being able to walk and talk with him spirit to spirit, God is still talking to Adam and Eve. Uh, 
Cain and Abel were offering sacrifices to God, and God had a, a, a conversation with Cain. I mean, Cain was a, murdered his brother, and God still was able to talk to him. God's not so weak that, that, that he, he can't stand our sin. Sin didn't affect God. Sin affected us and our ability to approach God. That had to be fixed. And, and here's, here's where unrighteousness stepped in. And they heard the, Lord, the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This, is, this was the righteous privilege that man had had. But Adam now had sinned. And, and Adam and his wife hid themselves in, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then God asked him, what's the deal, pal? What happened? And he said, because I did this. He now had a sense, the reason he hid himself, the reason the relationship was affected, not because God changed, but because Adam changed. Adam now had a sense of inferiority or guilt, and it changed the way he approached and came to God. He, he couldn't match up to God's standard, because God is the standard of the right relationship. In John 8, 34, says, And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. That's what had happened to Adam. Adam allowed sin into his life and sin distorted his ability to have a righteous relationship with God. It, it, it stopped him being able to come in with a sense of inferiority and guilt. Now, let, let me take it down to a, a, an earthly logical term, an everyday situation. I don't know if any of you have ever maybe gone into a home or into a, a, a house where a husband and wife may have um, had a disagreement or an argument over something or had fallen out about an issue and you arrive into their atmosphere, you arrive into the presence of both of them in, in the room, in the house, in the home. And although they are cordial toward you, you can sense that there's something wrong with the relationship that they have. And they're not saying it. I mean, to all intents and purposes, it looks like their everyday communicative skills are going on, you know, pass me this, do that, hello, hi, and whatever. But you can sense that the atmosphere is wrong. You can sense that there's a breakdown or there's something wrong in the relationship. Or maybe, you know, you've done something to someone and you weren't aware of it. And and you you notice that when you go in to, to to meet with them again, they, they're sort of standoffish or a bit cold and they're not saying it. It's not a said thing, but it's an understood thing. You think, oh, there's something wrong. I don't know what I did wrong. I mean, boy, they changed. I know we had this discussion or whatever and it just they seem to change their opinion or attitude towards me you understand what i'm saying you sense it you're aware of it sin marred the ability to come into the presence of god without a sense of inferiority or guilt again back on earthly terms let's say you knew you did something wrong let's imagine you you did something wrong to somebody and you did it intentionally and, and, and you did them wrong. You did them unjustly. And a few days or a week later, you come back into their presence and although they are cordial towards you and although they are, they're nice toward you, you're not yourself with them. You're not yourself with them because you have an awareness that you've done something intentionally against them. And although they, they're still nice and still the person they were last week, you think, well, they must not be aware of what I've done or what I said. And so you're always consciously aware that they might find out and if they find out and 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 you just can't be yourself like you used to be because you've done something against them well that's what adam done adam sinned and, and that sin separated adam 
from God and it, it marred his righteous relationship with God and man could no longer come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt or without an awareness of his sin consciousness and it totally changed the relationship. Now it didn't change God but it changed man. So Jesus answering said unto them, verily say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. When, when, you, when you're a sinner, you're sin conscious. Romans 6.16, Paul says this, Know ye not, or get an understanding, a revelation of this, that to whom you yield yourself a servant to obey, his servants are you to whom you obey. Whoever you bow your knee to becomes your master, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You're either a servant of sin or you're a servant of righteousness. But you're not the servant of both. Whoever you bow your knee to masters you. And so if, you, if you're if you a sinner, if you've committed sin, as Jesus said, you're the servant of it. You've bowed your knee to it and it becomes your master. You become the servant of it and you become sin conscious. You're constantly aware of your inadequacy, constantly aware of your inability to come into God's presence because you uh, have a sense of guilt. God knew what happened to us and it didn't change his love for us or it didn't change his plan for us either. Sometimes people think, you know, sin is such a big bad thing in the sense that it just God just could not God. So, no, God's God. He's an almighty God for goodness sake. So God went about resolving it Right in the garden, actually, the very first thing he said, he spoke to, he spoke to Satan and told him, hey, pal, you thought you got, you thought you, you beat me here with these, with these, with Adam and Eve? You didn't. I have a plan. I'll sort this out. And God had this plan and he started to reveal this plan to man over time. And God intended to fix that relationship where man would not be sin conscious, but would be able to come back into the presence of God without that a sense of inferiority or guilt or make them righteous or be in right standing with them based upon his standards, him being that standard, God being that standard. So as it's revealed, we, we God reveals this um, privilege here to, to, to sort of... Um, help the relationship Paul says or uh, Moses says here for the life of the flesh is in the blood he's speaking here under the inspiration of God for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given this blood onto you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul for it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul Although Adam had distorted and contaminated the relationship between man and God because of sin, because Adam had now become sin conscious and, and, and never from that time felt the ability to come back into the presence of God because of guilt, he was sin conscious. God endeavored to fix the relationship somewhat by introducing this thing called at one mint or at home mint. And he says, here's what I'll do. Because the price of sin is death, something has to die because of sin. I mean, something has to die to fix it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set in place a and a thing called an atonement or an at one mint. And here's what I'm going to do. Because something has to die, I'm going to take the life of something that is innocent, that wasn't guilty, that didn't do what you've done. And if you take that innocent creature, which we're going to use, and, and the death for what you've done is transferred, so to speak, symbolically, onto that creature, and because life is in blood, when you kill that creature and shed its blood, it sort of is symbolic of you being aware that you're a sinner, 
that you've done something wrong towards God. Death is the penalty, but that death has been passed into this animal for now, and 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 something died because of what you've done, and that blood of that animal animal will be used to temporarily cover your sin so that you can have somewhat a relationship with God. Somewhat uh, an ability to come into God's presence. Although still a sinner, although still under sin, it would give man a, an ability to approach God with a greater sense of relational connect without being overwhelmed by inferiority and guilt. Okay. I hope you're all sticking with me in this. So this introduction of atonement, where the, the, the blood of an innocent animal was shed not to, not to wipe away the sin, but to show that a price was paid for your action, and that blood covered temporarily that action so that you could have somewhat clear the air somewhat between you and God even though you were still a sinner. It didn't change you. It just gave you an opportunity now to engage God on a relational basis. And God was the one who set up this modus operandi to enable us to do that, called atonement. Hebrews 9.22, though, reminds us of this. Almost all things are by law purged with blood. In other words, in order to come to God, in order to, to be used by God, in order to connect with God, blood has to be used because blood it reminds the, 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 the participants that sin is, is, a, is a gap. Sin is a barrier. Sin has affected our relationship. And blood reminds us of that. And the shedding of the blood of something innocent reminds us that a price has to be paid for sin and so anything that is going to be used by God or deal with God has to be purged. Blood has to be applied to it. That awareness that, there's a, that there is a relational problem has to be acknowledged. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So if you want to deal with or have some relational connect with God, blood has to be involved. The thing about it was that blood had to be used constantly. And here's the reasons why. Here was the two problems. Because man sinned habitually. Man was always sinning. So every time he wanted to deal with God, he had to go out and find another innocent creature. And he had to take it. He had to lay his hands on it, confess the sins that he had committed and the, and the reason for death and for that sin. And then, then that was transferred to the, to the animal. And the animal's throat was slit. The blood was spilt. And God said, okay, we'll cover over that act of your disobedience, your sin, and, and we'll have some form of a relational connect. It didn't make you righteous, but it, it gave you a, a privilege of righteousness, even though you are not yet righteous. Problem with this process was man kept sinning, so man was continually, habitually offering sacrifices. And the second problem with this method Although it was temporary and although it allowed some engagement with God, the second problem with this method was the blood of animals couldn't remove sin, only cover it. it, it the blood, and, and, and although death was being issued because of, of a, a man's action, that death of that animal didn't change the person who committed the act. It covered over what he'd done so that, that he was saying to God, hey, I realize I did something wrong. And God said, well, okay, that's a good start in the relationship. That's a good acknowledgement. It didn't make you righteous, but hey, you at least realize where we're at in our relationship. So yes, how can I help you? But it didn't change you. You're still a sinner habitually, and the blood of animals can't change you, but it is a process that God set in motion to allow us to engage God relationally somewhat. 
But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There was nothing to be able to come to God with because we had to constantly acknowledge the barrier. We had to constantly acknowledge our, our sin consciousness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. The writer of Hebrews says, For the law, because God gave the law of which atonement was a part, this, this um, method by which God set up that we could uh, have access to him relationally, but didn't change the people who were coming. For the law having a shadow of better things that were coming, but didn't have the very image of those things. It, it promised us, it gave us some idea, well, you know what, if we could just find a blood that was good enough, if we could just find a sacrifice that was good enough. I mean, this sacrifice of animals gives us some form of access, but boy, if we could find something better than this. I mean, is there anything else we can do? Is there something better than this? And so that process that God gave called atonement give us hope. That, that maybe something better would come, but it, it didn't produce the better, but it, it, it made us wish for or desire for or at least hope that maybe we could find something better than this. Because here is a process. Blood is a process. The, the death of the innocent for the guilty is a process. So it says here, for the law had a shadow, it, 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 you know, a shadow is not the real thing. It's just, I mean, the shadow of a dog never bit anybody. I mean, the shadow is a shadow. It, it, the shadow shows us that there is a real, but the shadow isn't itself the real. So this atonement was a shadow of something that could possibly be real, but it itself wasn't the real thing. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of those things, could never could never, with those sacrifices, all these atonements, all these sacrifices for sin that, that we were introduced to in the law, although they, they enabled us to relate to God, they enabled the doers of it to relate to God somewhat, it could never, with those sacrifices, which they offered year after year continually, make the ones who were doing the sacrifice perfect. All of, the, all of this stuff that they were doing continually because man sinned habitually. Man was sinning habitually. The blood couldn't remove sin, only cover it. Well, it can never with those sacrifices, which they offered continually year after year, make the comers thereon to perfect. It, it, didn't ha it, had, it, it covered the sin temporarily. It swept it under the mat. So they came to God and said, I really want to, I want, really want to engage and encounter God relationally, but I'm a sinner, so I'll make an atonement for what I've done. And so to make this atonement, life would be offered, blood would be shed, and that sin was put under the carpet, but the lump and the hump and the bump under the carpet didn't go away. So although we thought we had a level playing field, we could still see the hump in the middle of the carpet because that hump was our sin. It was still there. But this was a temporary method that God gave for humanity to be able to engage him relationally. Verse 2. I'll read verse 1 and 2 again. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereon too perfect. Animal sacrifice wasn't good enough, wasn't powerful enough to fix us. It, it served a purpose, but it couldn't fix us. For then would they have ceased to be offered because the worshippers, once purged, we should have had no more conscience of sin. He said, if it had been good enough, if the blood of a bull and a goat, if the blood of a turtle dove or an animal is sacrificed, had the power to fix us, then we wouldn't have had to keep coming year after year again and again. But we would have only had to offer it the once and then we would have been purged from our sin consciousness. But we weren't. So the offerer, of the sacrifices, even though they offered it, even though it sort of leveled the playing field, so to speak, to give us some relational connect with God, there was still a hump in the middle. 
there was still we still knew the stuff was under the carpet and we were still sin conscious it didn't fix us so it, it distorted our relationship it hindered our relationship there was an air between us toward God we were sin conscious let me see if I can wind this down for today all of us mankind was unable to resolve this issue we couldn't solve it we, we were using the blood of bulls and goats it was temporary but it was continual because it couldn't fix us and here's the reason for we had all sinned all of us came short of the glory of God and there was none righteous, as it is written. There was none righteous, no, not one. We weren't there because we were righteous. We were there because God set up this credit system. You know, with a credit card, sometimes you don't have the money in the bank, but you're still given the credit nonetheless. With, with, with God, the blood of bulls and goats and atonement and, and the offering of sin for or sacrifice for sin was like a credit card. Um, it, it allowed us the privilege, but you still had to pay the bill. The bill's still there. So sometimes you go out with your credit card and you don't see any money, you just see the credit card and say, yeah, I'll buy that, yeah. But it still has to be paid. And so <clears throat> this atonement, this offering of blood, uh, was like a, a God accrediting this privilege to us, but it... it it still had to be paid for. The, the, the debt still stood. Man was still a sinner. Man was still unrighteous. Man still had this sin consciousness that made him feel inferior and guilty. He was unrighteous. There, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Man had a problem because of Adam. Man had a relational deficit with God, not because of God, but because of man's unrighteousness. The system God set up was temporary. The system God set up was not perfect because the blood of bulls and goats wasn't able to fix the offerer of, of the sacrifice. Man still was sin conscious man still was inferiority had inferiority and guilt we needed somebody to fix it man couldn't fix it man himself was a sinner and man himself was unrighteous we we needed help to fix it there was nobody among us to fix it and that's what we're going to talk about next week it's a very this truth is a very pivotal truth for your Christian walk, never mind your ability just to put on the armor of God. But if we don't grasp what God did for us in Christ and, and how he fixed this relationship with us, every time you go out to engage principalities and the powers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, if you're not confident in your relationship with God, if you don't fully understand that you are not a sinner in Adam, but you are righteous in Jesus Christ, it's a game changer. It changes the attitude in the way you do things. I'll close with this analogy just to help us grasp this one. When when I'm living at home, when I'm in Ireland and somebody knocks on my door and I give them access to my home, they cordially and respectfully understand that it's not their house, it's my home and everything in it is mine and that they've been invited in. Uh, I've allowed them to come in and they sit at my table and I give them and offer them my hospitality uh, and my way. I mean, they don't demand hospitality. They don't demand that I put them or cook a meal. But I, I may prepare a meal and show them, you know, hospitality and have some relationship across the table as we talk and, and I listen to them and they listen to me. And they sit there and the relationship has 
boundaries to it. It has parameters to it because they've been invited in. Because they, they don't belong there, but they've been invited into there. And so they had, they had come to the front door, they rang the bell, knocked the door. I opened the door and I invited them in under my terms and conditions. And they sit there and they cordially have relationship with me, but they are aware that I invited them in the, into there. And that they will eventually have to leave there because they don't belong there. But while I'm sitting in my kitchen and they are sitting with me, the people who came to the door, knocked the door and came in that I invited in, and, and they are cordially accepting our, our relational connect, our, our discourse, our conversation, with the awareness that they don't belong there, but they've been invited in there. All of a sudden, uh, the back door opens, or the front, doesn't matter. In storms my son, Adam. I didn't invite him in. He didn't knock the door to come in. When he walks in, he goes, Hi, Dad. Hello, sir. Walks over to the refrigerator, pulls out the food, grabs the milk, drinks it out of the jug, and starts to make himself a sandwich or whatever. And then walks over, gives me a hug, peck on the cheek, and says, Hey, Dad, I'm going to borrow the car, uh, or I'm going to take the car, and uh, I've got a money there, I want to put gas in it. And I said, well, my wallet, and he said, oh, your wallet's over here, Dad. And he opens the wallet, and he takes out $50, and he walks out the door with the keys of the car, and he's gone. Now, of course, the other individual sitting across the table watches all this. He's aware that he's been invited in. He doesn't belong there, but nonetheless, he's in my home, receiving my hospitality and having a communicative conversation with me by my invitation, but he doesn't belong there. And he watched my son walk right in and enjoy all of the privileges of my home, my kitchen, my refrigerator, my food, my resources, my goods, and he just walked around and treated them like they were all his. I mean, because the difference was he belongs there. He belongs there because he's my kid. He's my son. Everything I have is his. He's my kid. Our relational connect, my relational connect to my son and my relational connect to this individual that knocked my door and I invited them to come in, they're they're two different relationships, although they're both sitting in the kitchen at that time. One's invited in, the other has the right to come in. One has access to me conditionally, the other has unconditional access and privilege. That's the difference. The atonement in, invited them to come in to relate with God but there was boundaries and parameters to it. And they were always aware of that because they were always aware that they didn't belong there because they had the sense of inferiority or guilt. But God brought them in anyway. But they were constantly sin conscious. And it, 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 they had a relationship, but it was, it was under the awareness that they were sin conscious. And God is righteous. But, when my son walked in, that's a different relationship. My son is righteous in relationship with me. He doesn't need an invite to come in. He has access to all I have because our relationship is completely different. My son and I have a relationship that is righteous. He's able to come into my presence without a sense of inferiority or guilt. I don't make him feel guilty. I don't tell him, hey, do you know how much it costs me to buy that bread? I'm not constantly making him aware of any inadequacy. He's my son. I love him. I die for him. That's how much I love him. And so here's these two individuals in my presence. One has access to everything I am because of a righteous relationship and the other one has access to me 
um, with with conditions not based on their righteousness but based on my invite to bring them in temporarily for the purpose of an engagement god was going to fix that and that's what we're going to talk about next week that's that is a that's something we have to grasp something we have to understand if we're going to engage this other arena and and change the influence on human affairs then we've got to walk in there with an attitude and an awareness and an understanding of who we are and what we have in christ so um, i knew when i started this this was going to be longer than than one session so we're talking about righteousness and i will take it up again next week so um if you have any questions concerning that um please feel free to write them in i'll, I'll probably answer a lot of them next week um and think about these things. Please come back and listen to this again. You will not get this in one sitting. You won't. I'm telling you now. What I'm sharing with you has taken decades of thinking and meditation and and um, study. And I, I'm on. I unpacked everything. I unpacked decades of musing over principles and concepts and grasping understandings and revelation I, i've unpacked a lifetime of thinking in an hour you are not going to get it all in an hour i understand that so help me and help yourself by going back over it and going back over these concepts again you will not get any of this in one sitting you will have to think about these things it comes by revelation. We can share the word with you, but God's got to illuminate that in your inner man. You've got to see it. And only God can do that for you. I can help bring understanding, but only God can give you revelation. So, and let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Pray, God, that you would enlighten and illuminate us concerning these important issues. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me this morning.